signed up. Anybody? Yeah, this one more Do I have a motion to go into public hearing? So moved. 
have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. We are in uh, motion and a second. Do I have a vote? All in favor? Motion carries. And we are in public hearing number one at 606 p.m. Okay. May I ask a favor? Sure. I have a bum knee. I sit up front and y'all excuse me for sitting here in my presentation. Sure. Thank you.
thing I want to ask you, you said, is there a current road to get to that lake, or is it just a path? There's a current drive. There's a drive at I'd like to put in a motion that we accept the rezoning of this property based on the recommendation from the planning and zoning and from our planning department. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. So it's said. Would you repeat the motion? Sure. That motion. That made a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we have a Thank you all very much. That particular case is over, so anyone that's here associated with that may leave. Thank you all very much. And we'll wait and see if there's anyone else downstairs that wants to come up. So we'll take a short break and then give them an opportunity to sign in once they come in. It's all a learning experience for all of us. We're on short break. Except for, except for this one. 
before we get started on item number two of the public hearing, or item number seven, number two under number seven, we need to discuss time periods. Um, 10 to 20 minutes, I think, will be is our uh, amount that we have put. So if I could have a vote from the board, how long we want each side to be able to speak? 10 to 20 minutes, and then there will be a five minute rebuttal for each side. So I just have the pleasure of the board. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, you said our rules is 10 to what, 20 minutes? 10 to 20 minutes per side. Do we know how many people we have signed up to speak? We do. We have six total, four in four opposed, and no, five opposed, one in favor. I'd like to, in, in order that everyone can be heard, I would like to make a recommendation that the total amount is 15 minutes, and then the five minutes is all the time. And they have to split that 15 minutes up between the total of the people that want to speak. Can you measure that form of a motion? Yes, I do. Okay. So we have a motion for 15 minutes with a five minute rebuttal. Do we have a second? Sure. All right, a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Each side will have 15 minutes to speak. There are five that are actually opposed, four that are in favor of, I mean one that's in favor of. So what we will do is give each side to talk 15 minutes. You will need to divide that up amongst yourselves for that total. And then once we get to the rebuttal, each side will have five minutes to separate. So, okay. I'll wait a minute. Could I make a, could I get a motion to go into public hearing for item number two, case number six? So moved. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second, all in favor? Motion carried. We're in public hearing at 6 
with conditions that included a subdivision sign with landscaping, three lots on the east side of Roswell Lee shall be 1.9 acres, four of the newly created lots shall be building sites for 1,450 heated square foot minimum homes, three of the newly created lots shall be building sites for 1,800 heated square foot minimum homes. Staff recommendation is to approve as to approve the preliminary plat and rezoning to RD only with full compliance with the following conditions. The developer shall pay at his expense Culpeper Circle and Highway 54 to Culpeper Road using the specifications of 6, inch, six inches GAV, 2 inch binder, and 2 inch hopper with a 3 year bond for 1 and a half times the cost of the job. Secondly, the developer shall also provide a turnaround at the intersection of Culpeper Road using county road specifications. Staff offered alternative options to the developer. The first option was to divide the 16.65 acres into three lots of five plus acres for LDR requirements. There'd be no rezoning or preliminary plan approval required. The second option was to create two five acre lots at LDR zoning and two two plus acre lots RD zoning with the approval on rezoning of the two acre lots from LDR to RD. As I said, we do not have a planning commission, so I do not have a recommendation from the planning commission, just that um, the recommendation to approve the plat uh, and the rezoning would be with the paving and the turnaround for the two options that are also presented. And that is your office's recommendation? Yes, sir. Chairman, I, I wanted to, uh, everybody can hear me. I wanted to add just a couple of comments to this, uh, uh, this case that's about to report. Uh, as Kathy just told you guys, this is a request uh, to increase from three lots under the current zone up to seven lots with all these access and short steps and curb roads about one third of the time. Uh, if you use two cars of a home and you use two trips a day, uh, with the seven, you're looking at 28 trips a day, additional trips on the dirt road. If you added at three, which is already allowed, uh, for a zone, it would be 12 trips a day. Now, uh, long before this application ever came before the board, uh, we discussed concerns and issues with subdivision development off the dirt roads. There's two ways to address this. One is to improve the road by paving and bring it up to the county standards. And uh, the other issue is to lower the density by utilizing the five acre fence, okay? And um, it, it's not just a conversation you've had, but there's real issues out there. And a lot of these stem around the safety uh, for both of you and the existing owners and, and residents of the building. During heavy rain events, uh, the dirt roads here in, in the county become almost Heavy traffic. We've seen this time and time again. This road off Allen Road earlier this year uh, that I went out. I could barely travel that road with a four-wheel drive truck. I don't know how the people were getting in and out. Uh, because of that, we had to get our crews there uh, immediately. We had to pull them off other jobs and make a, an emergency response there just so the resident could get out and go home, you know, get in, go, you know, coming home, or get out uh, going to work. And we had to pull our crews from other uh, work they were doing just to address this emergency situation. And this happens time and time again when you have the extra traffic uh, that's generated with, uh, you know, with uh, subdivisions on dirt roads. Uh, another example is, uh, is Beulah Evans Road. I know we've heard that, that mentioned a hundred times uh, in the time I've been here. And uh, because of the development of subdivisions and a lot of uh, heavier traffic, that road is a constant maintenance type. Uh, it also in, increases uh, the potential for issues with their EMS fire. These trucks are very heavy, uh, so they're top heavy, and uh, if I can't get a four-wheel drive truck with uh, uh, off-road high clearance up through there, I don't know how, I, I wouldn't really want to be driving a fire truck with an ambulance. There. So, uh, and another thing that we see, uh, 
is every time there's a subdivision or, or numerous uh, development off the road, the county commission can come here sooner or later. We want the road paid. And, and what they'll be doing is they will come back and they will be asking for uh, the county taxpayers to pay for the paving of the road. And uh, that happens over and over and over again. Um, and for that and, and many other reasons that, that we've discussed, um, is the reason staff does not recommend less than a five acre lot uh, off of the road. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions for, you know, before we have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right, so we will go ahead and move into the 15 minutes we'll have to Alright, so if you can, Mr. J.D. and uh, Ms. Laura Benz. Ms. Laura Benz is representing uh, about the never been a problem for me, so it should be just fine. Um, my name is Laura Benz, I'm with the Benz Law Group. I'm here on behalf of JV Communities. Um, I submitted a written document that I don't know if you all have a, have a copy of. I brought extra just in case. That was when we thought we were all gonna be here, and given the temperature in here, I'm glad that you guys rescheduled, because I assume with all these people, it would have been very, very warm in here um, if we had gone ahead. So um, I just wanna quick kind of go through and address some of the concerns and uh, why we believe that this uh, variant, or pardon me, this rezoning should be um, approved. It satisfies the request that has been uh, submitted to the county, satisfies the requirements that are set forth, in, set forth in your ordinance. Specifically, right now, the property is LDR. We're asking for it to be RD. That is a difference of approximately four homes um, in that area. Uh, the by dividing it and allowing those four additional homes, we're allowing there to be more affordable homes. Obviously, the larger acre tracks, there is a cost associated with those. So when you allow it to be done in a two acre, you're allowed for more people to come and enjoy a rural landscape, but while also having an affordable home. Um, the actual definition of RD is a rural designation. So please, let's all not be confused. This will still be a rural um, environment. That's why these areas are very attractive to people. They're looking for that rural landscape. Um, originally, the dirt road, obviously the county's recommendation is for it to be paved, but one of the main reasons that uh, my client was attracted to it was being able to provide that rural feel uh, for potential homeowners. Um, the Property that surrounds the area is not going to be adversely affected. They'll be able to still continue doing all of the activities which they typically would be doing. Um, they'll be able to do their agricultural activities. There will be no impact to them whatsoever. Um, if we, under Georgia as well as federal law, we have a right to farm act. We have other things that protect agricultural activities within the state of Georgia. We're a very ag friendly um, state. So there should be no impact on any of that. As far as the property values, um, we are looking at giving a much greater tax base to the county. Right now, the parcel as it is brings in about $1,300, $1,400 per year. If we were allowed to develop the homes at approximately $200,000 of the structure value, you're looking at an increase up to almost $20,000 a year in taxes. So if you're talking about going $1,300 to $20,000, as that increase in tax revenue for um, for the county. This is located within the comps plan uh, peripheral growth area. It was what was anticipated for growth. It's along a major transportation corridor. Um, and so as far as the future use and comp as what the goals are for the county, we believe that this proposal satisfies those goals. Um, my client has proposed to adhere to every other zoning uh, state, local, federal requirement with this, with this development. There are no other uh, variances or modifications being asked. He's developed approximately 40 homes already in Merriweather. 
um, with great success. He's known as being a reputable builder. There have been no complaints, no citations, nothing of that manner um, as, as far as legally complaints on any of that construction. And I think that's important uh, for, the, for the commission to consider. Um, when we're talking about, I do want to add, I know that there was some concern, or there have been concerns previously about erosion. And what are you going to do with the stormwater and all of those sorts of things. We are still required to have all of the NPDES permits, um, so which means that the appropriate erosion and sedimentation control measures are being taken. We're having silt fence. We're having all the stormwater, making sure that he's meeting the required flows under the blue book and any other applicable restrictions to make sure that there's no impact to downstream or adjacent property owners. It is important to note that there are no blue line streams. There's no waters of the U.S., no wetlands, those sorts of environmental features. Um, that would be on the property that you could say could possibly be impacted by any sedimentation. We, this particular piece of property does not have any of those features. Um, so going back to kind of what we're talking about, we're talking about the proposal for seven lots versus the proposal of what would be three. So um, as the administrator said, we're talking about four extra homes and he kind of discussed a little bit of the usage difference between three homes and, and seven homes. Um, Based on what has been proposed, he's not clear cutting the properties. All of the front part is being remained vegetated or you know wooded as it currently sits. Um, as Ms. Kathy said, the property has not been touched for 30 years, so it has a thick, you know, forested type of appearance. So all that they're cutting is the driveway access and the room for the structure, which is approximately a half an acre. So when you look at a half an acre of disturbance, and we're talking times seven, you know, you're at about three and a half acres of disturbance out of the 16.65. So that's not a tremendous amount of disturbance. The existing vegetation should be able to handle all of that um, and serve as additional buffer for any other types of land disturbing activities that, that would be going on for the construction of the homes. Currently, the zoning requires that the property um, any of the properties be built with a minimum of square footage of 1,250 square feet. Obviously, there's been some concerns with phase one, you know, wanting to have a little bit larger of a home. We would propose that the limitation be a minimum square footage of 1,450 on this. Um, and that way, that allows him to adjust to the market. Obviously, if people come and say, I would like to build an 1,800 square foot home, they're able to do that. But those people that may not be able to afford an 1,800 square foot home would still have the option to come in and move into Meriwether County. Um, one thing is the need. We talk about, Meriwether in your comp plan talked about that one of the biggest things you need is new affordable housing and you needed some smaller homes to fit that niche. I had done some research when we were supposed to be here in May and it changed a little bit since then. But I did, uh, I contacted or looked at our good friend the Zillow and look to see how many properties are available with certain square footage sizes. And back in May, there were approximately uh, 29 homes that had a square footage of approximately 1,450 to, pardon me, 1,450 to 1,800 square feet. 10 of those were in foreclosure, and that is across the county. If you ask, hey, how many of those homes were built within the last 20 years, we dropped significantly down. When I looked at that now, today, if you look at houses that have two acres or more, um, pardon me, two acres or more, there are 43 properties. When you say, okay, how many are 1,750 square feet or less, which is because I have to pick the Zillow windows of, of what they do for square footage, you drop down to 21 properties. If you look at from 2000, which houses have been built before, pardon me, after 2000, you drop down to five. One, which is a shed, by the way. I mean, it literally is a, it's a shed. It's not a true house. So you're talking about, if you want a house in Meriwether County with two acres or more, with um, under 1,750, pardon me, 1,750 square feet, you have four houses that have been built in the last 20 years to choose from. That's it. So this is definitely serving a need. Phase one is already completely sold out. It's been done before they even broke ground. Those houses were sold and done. There is a need and a desire to move to this area and to help you know, grow and, and, and get involved in your community. 
Um, I think you know we're just talking about the difference between three and seven homes. Obviously, as a developer, it becomes easier to provide a more affordable option by having and breaking down the acreage. People don't have to buy that cost. We would assert that um, that we should not be paving the road. One, it's the nicest problem, or pardon me, dirt road that I think I have ever been on. If you've ever driven on it, it was one of those where you start driving and there's like no even bounces. It's just a nice smooth road, which is probably part of the reason that these folks love living on that road. Um, we would assert that, you know, requiring a road to be paved for the sake of being paved um, when it's not a legal requirement under your ordinance now um, is is probably not in the best interest of what of the eight people that already live there. I mean, there have been several comments about the reason they chose to move in that area was because they like the rural area, they like the dirt road. Um, that's the same reason why my client had acquired the property to try to do to do that development on that dirt road. Um, the only other thing that I would just say is, um, you know, I don't consider this what you would think of is when we start talking about a subdivision, I think of, you know, when you drive in and you go through all of the different streets and neighborhoods and things like that, that uh, which is of the, the neighborhood that's just you know, a little ways away, about, I think about 400 yards or so. Um, this was set out to be more of a rural, like you're living off the main road and it gives you that, that feeling of um, living in a more rural community. Uh, as I said before, by definition, RD is rural. Um, so by the ordinance's own language, it can't be argued that this is not a rural, a rural development because um, the ordinance clearly states that RD is a rural resolution. Um, if you look at the back of the map, or the back of my the submission that I provided to y'all, there's highlighted so you can see that there were already four or five houses, or pardon me, properties that were less than the five acre minimum, even on Cold Public Circle. So there are existing properties within that proximity that already are less than the five acre minimum um, that, that is currently zoned. And I think I've covered just about everything that, that I want to for now, and I'll just um, reserve any time to answer any questions or provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wanting to speak in favor? All right. We will move to the next 15 minutes, but we have five individuals who have signed up. Um, Ms. Lassiter, Jacob, Jack, Jack John Reynolds, Nico Montagues, and Kat Jenkins. So we'll need minimum of three minutes each, but a total of 15, so if some go over, then we'll have to adjust that at the end of So whoever would like to speak first. Uh, before we start, we put that in the package. Thank you. And if you'll just state your name. Jack, last All right, last Good evening. We allow the citizens who are unable to attend today to propose their asking to vote no to the zone on phase two of our first station, LDR five acres, RD two acres. At the November 26th commission meeting, the new minutes, it is noted that the minister gave indicated he would have to deal with a five acre lot, as well as there are multiple correspondences in this important first to the building to the funding department for after indicating he cannot build a seven acre lot on the third road. Are requests for the board to approve the zone without the building to 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 the building our request is not the zoning without the road being paid. The building and zoning director wrote the prior law that the subdivision phase two could not be done in the subdivision and will not be allowed on their road and Mr. Bird has been noted. For our open record documentation, these numerous emails and correspondence have been provided to you. So we are we are even why are we even discussing phase two of the Colbert State? Is the road being paid? So now the builder wants seven lots or a compromise of some kind so he can find a cheap way to build a subdivision without having to do his part for the citizens of Mary Road County. There are six homeowners and two landowners on Culpeper Circle and Drive, along with concerned citizens who are against this rezoning to accommodate the builder. 
Is this a precedence we want to set for our county? Citizens and citizens and the county will be left with a mess from the government is on the evidence and the sloppy paving of roads that underwhelp subdivision. Scope the circle to this the farms from 13 acres to 60 acre tracks and homes from 1900 to 3800 square foot. The average size of the home is 2,500 feet square foot on Coper Circle and Coper Drive. The rezoning to RD for a subdivision will adversely affect our farms and home values. Coper Circle should remain the LBR five acres and continue to serve as our buffer for our farms and the RD zoning for the newly created subdivision on Rockwell Lee Road for the new. According to the Muni County Director Emails and Correspondence, and Minister Gay received from our open record request that the subdivision law that the subdivision cannot be built on the dirt road nor any land we found. We're asking if you would allow anything to be built, the square footage of homes should be comparable, requiring 2,500 feet square foot homes to meet the existing average home size on five acre plus lots, even though the builder should not be permitted to build at all in phase two on the dirt road. We have been dealing with over the state phase one and two JV community for 10 months. Why wasn't the master plan community not the best to spur our compare for the comprehensive plan prior to building and approval? We're asking you to vote no to the zoning of the best Thank you. Thank you.
welcome a report addressing these concerns and questions. We ask that you vote no to the proposed zoning on Culpeper Circle. The land should remain five acre tracks. And if for some unknown reason you allow him to build phase two on the five acre tracks, the minimum heating, heated square footage should be 2,500 square feet to be comparable with the home on Culpeper Circle and Drive. The lawyer did not add in the extra land that landowners have purchased uh, that go with our homes. So please vote no um, against this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lassie. We'll have eight minutes left. Eight minutes remaining. Um, Mr. Reynolds? Um, I just wanted to add, add a couple of things, really. I'm not sure. I keep hearing that this dirt road and subdivisions, and I'm I'm a little bit educated, but in the Meriwether E laws, it states for the subdivisions in Article 11 that paving is required for any subdivision. And if you remember back in November notes, this phase two, regardless of how, even if you build one home on it it's considered part of phase one, and that means it is a subdivision. So either you have to give them a, an allowance to keep it unpaid, or it has to be paid. So I'm not sure where all this is coming from. The other question is, where, where's the buffer going to be between Terry and Jack's land that's LDR and these, which are going to be RD? There's only a road separating. So what in our laws uh, do that? Um, also, I'm asking that you support the citizens in this meeting. If you remember back in November, we got over 200 people who were signed up in support of what we were doing to not allow these buildings to happen. And the commission granted to allow Mr. Bird to build, which is fine. That's, that's totally within your right. But as Terry suggested, there's been many things that have happened since then with this building process. The other thing that I will call out is I don't. Even, it's not even my job, but I don't even believe that the culverts that are actually installed in Phase One are in accordance with your subdivision ordinances as they are are now because they're black plastic, and the ordinances require them to be either concrete or um, galvanized pipe. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have six minutes and thirty seconds left, Mr. Nico. Good evening. I hope I speak loud enough because most of the time I don't. So my name is Nico Bond, that's my wife. I am not as long as you know, neighbors in the area of five years. But I also want to say that we are representing a lot of other um, in, um, citizens that cannot be here tonight because of COVID. But as, as John said, in November, <coughs> uh, November 2019, when we had the first three zones, um, we accepted that decision and, and finally because part of that meeting, you will, you will remember, part of that meeting was that the was made to stick with, um, to stick with um, five acre laws for phase two. So it was sort of accepted by us that, okay, you know, it's on the front, it's on the front of phase one. Let's accept two acre lots. But it was sort of the general acceptance, I you know it was not a decision made, but the general acceptance that place two will stay fine. So, I actually had a couple of things that's the same as Terry and John that they had in their speech, but the one thing I want to do quickly is just the reality of the facts that we see, the way that we see this, is the proposed subdivision, although it's stated that it satisfies the uh, mode of the current um, Code of ordinances. We, I, I still see uh, where it does not mean that code of ordinances. Like, uh, like for instance, if you look at you look at the uh, R, um, RV um, classification, they're talking about the dirt road that um, John was mentioning, and also the type of styles of homes for ALDR and RV. 
the part of the is that our body is definitely not like a state. Um, in, in that uh, um, um, document. So the, uh, the, the one thing in this that I also clearly think I see is that although it's proposed that the, the uh, rezoning for phase two will be beneficial, obviously, to the builder, to Maryville County, Texas, and also beneficial to us, and, and I don't think that is absolutely true. It is not beneficial for the existing as you know, for the existing um, citizens of Middle River that can be on top of the road. One thing I also want to mention is that, yes, the, the tracks or the parcels are smaller than five acres around that area, but most of us have got between six and 40 acres, I think, because we have two or more parcels per company. That is the real size of the, the, the the locations in that area. The, the houses itself as well is, like they said, I looked it up as well, the average is 2.5 thousand square feet in that area. You cannot look at many river county as a county and then determine what should be compatible with the houses that, that's in that area. It's 2,500 square feet. That's what it is now. And that, as a result, if we bought something smaller, it will impact the the uh, cost of the uh, um, properties. So I'm going to skip a couple of here. One of the things I want to say as well is it was mentioned there is no impact to us in that area. I don't know if you, you cannot see it on maps, but the, the phase one and phase two of this development is both what we know between us and the access to Georgia for the people. We are not going to have a choice to enter or exit through a dirt road with seven entrances on it or a tarmac road with seven entrances on it, which we already have as far as well. I can't see for the life of me how we can do seven entrances on a dirt road, and especially with the restrictions that Mr. Gary Pop called out earlier, I think that is a problem. So lastly, I just want to, I don't want to take away more people time from, from somebody else. I, I would just ask you to consider, seriously consider voting no for, um, you know, against the two acre rezoning, out here, rezoning and, and starting with that on the line. And we appreciate um, the services of the board. Thank you. How much time
our zoning, our laws, they've clouded what they can, and so I don't think you give them another chance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that does conclude our amount of, yeah. So we will give five minutes rebuttal time to each side, and we will start with Ms. Ben. Back up and talk. 
Um, we would request that you know our, our zoning be a plot approved as requested, which would be the seven acres, no paving. If you should choose to require the paving, we would also request that we be given those alternatives, that planning commission option. Um, so that would be a, a, a the two five acres um, with a RD for two two acre lots, no paving. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yeah. Would you repeat what you just said? In, in, in the set, um, just repeat what you just said. I didn't hear it. Um, yes, ma'am. I said that if we would obviously request that the zoning be done seven acres, no paving. Um, but if the board should be so inclined, we would also uh, be like to have the board consider what planning had said as an alternative, which would be two five acre lots and two two acre lots. Two five acre lots and two two. I mean, pardon me, having you know the two two acre lots for the RV, and that includes paving. No, no, that was not part of the recommendation from um, the county. Okay, let me just repeat that. Two acre lots, <coughs> two. It's, oh. No, he doesn't want to do that. Never mind. Okay. So we scratch that last part. Scratch it. Just request what was already asked for. Sorry. Thank you. And we'll give Ooh, five minutes that. for rebuttal on that. <laughs> Once again, I want to go back to the houses that were being built. There is a letter from Theron Gay to Kathy Johnson that read our initial findings for six of the seven homes did not meet the requirements. And you all have that. Um, and he put in here, after meeting with the builders and working on a resolution to the issue, we released the stop work order. And here's Theron's drawings where he went out and made new drawings to correct the scripture. Uh, we definitely need to grow, 
but we don't want to do it at the expense of our future growth. And when we look at these houses, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, are these going to be the houses that we want people to be living in or that they want to be living in? Are, are these the houses that people are going to want to spend money and they're going to want to be there? So I, I hope so. But based on what we've seen, uh, these are minimum square footage houses and there's, there's a housing boom still going on even despite COVID. You can look and you can see that we have, um, that houses are selling really fast once they get on the market. Uh, so we don't need to set our expectations too low. And I think that our community, and especially since we have the nature, which is a, a rural development, um, low density rural development, that we don't sell it short. And that we make sure that the people that live in these areas um, aren't living next to houses that in 10 or 15 years become run down because they're not of the best quality that they could have been. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. We have a minute and 15 seconds to go somewhere else. I just wanted to reiterate, um, Roswell Lee Road is now part of the rezoning to the middle for the two-acre track. Cold Pepper Circle is LDR. That is where our farms are, and right across the street is the land that's trying to rezone. It needs to stay by the year old in our livelihood in your hands. We, we're just begging you to leave it by the track, not do anything smaller than that. On that dirt road, because of what Administrator Katie said to you about the dirt road, as well. So, uh, we appreciate you listening to us. Thank you. Yeah, you want to 30 seconds. We have 30 seconds. Is there anyone else who would like to provide? All right. Here in the could I have a motion to go out of the chair for the public hearing? If there was a document, I don't know if you want to make it part of the record, uh, but the William Till had actually two documents to present. If you want to make that part of the record, actually, uh, we would like to make this whole packet part of the record. Really and the document is in there. Everything we reference is in there. And everybody has is this that. here. Yes, here. I just wanted to make and sure that it worked. Is in there along with the draw. I want to make sure the clerk has it. Okay. So may I have a motion to go out to the public hearing for case number six? So we have a motion to have a second. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. We are out of the executive session at 7.09. I do believe that. This one is also in Commissioner Hines' district, so I will turn it over to Commissioner Hines. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, would like to thank all those who uh, came up and spoke and shared their concerns regarding this rezoning. I, too, uh, have received several information and several different packages, and I also have some concern about a subdivision being put on a dirt road and even if it's a different phase. Um, one of the gentlemen that spoke talked about a master plan and most times when you do a subdivision there is a master plan and unfortunately this was done in such a way in two different phases. But the first phase is on a paved road. And unfortunately, there has been some challenge regarding this uh, phase one. But my main concern is uh, rezoning this to the point on a dirt road. And we have several, uh, I won't necessarily call them subdivisions, but anything that's over four homes constitutes a subdivision in the Arizona County Ordinance. And we're now dealing with the, the fact that that was not necessarily done properly at some point in time, and it does fall back on the county. And everyone who lives in those areas are constantly saying they want their road paid. Um, I personally feel that this is not a good fit for uh, Culpeper Circle. I've been on that road, and there's sections of the road it narrows. It goes into a, it has like a bend circle around, I think Nikos lived in that. It gets narrower. 
and actually is really no dirt. It's, it's just, it's, it has a drop off. So the road has to be expanded at some point in time. There's just no way you can have that much traffic coming off of Culpeper Circle unless there's some way that road has to be improved. So I, I really do have some concerns about that. Um, before, I would like to make a motion regarding but I would like to hear from other commissioners at this time if they want to make a comment. Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask some clarification about the issuance of the permits and then what was actually built. I think we've heard two different stories about that and I, I was under the impression that the permits were actually issued, a couple of issued for 1,900 square feet, which would have been above the, the amount, but when they were measured, they did not equal up to what we had approved. I just like some clarification sure. on that. There, I think there was some, uh, some issues with what all would count into the square footage I know we're planning zones ask that we be very careful the city square footage to be sure we get the case. He is square footage. Uh, there was the tension that well that that was code square footage. Uh, but if I believe uh in time so you know, square footage, that is heated square footage. And when we looked at the heated square footage, uh, you know, it, it required uh, you know uh, an extension of the room here. Uh, an expansion of bonus room and other things to beat that minimum heated square footage. Now, we have since, uh, you know, Beth, uh, and we talked about how to, you know, uh, correct that going forward. Uh, and now the homes, I have personally measured that they are meeting the square footage requirements. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have a question also regarding that. So when we issue a permit, are we issuing it with the total square footage or the heated square footage? We're, we're now issuing it with the heated square footage. Oh, oh, the actual permit is that the total square footage is not heated. That's what the permit has on the actual program. It's the total square footage. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be the, on the heated square footage as far as meeting our requirements. Yes. So if when you have, you said a minimum square footage, that is really nice. The garage, So based on the different information that was given to us, out of the seven homes that were proposed that had a permit, six of them did not have the right square heated square footage. I, I think uh, Ms. Lasker has the uh, information there. Uh, I can't remember. I mean, I know the majority did not. Uh, and I went out and you know, I had to go to the room to do the expansion and it, it involved really an uh, extension of a room I think off of the room, dining area and kitchen and the expansion of the uh, bonus room of the room. Uh, in regards to the house of seven homes on the dirt road, personally, I think that's too much. Right now, we're dealing with a situation where, in my district, where there was subdivision built. Well, actually, that road was paved, but the dirt road that everyone has to enter is not paved. So that is causing a lot of issues. Because when people get on the road, maybe they think that I'm satisfied, but when the mud and the rain and all come, that becomes a issue, and that is a burden on the county. So therefore, uh, personally, I think that that would be too much, and there is no way that people with that many houses on a small dirt road is going to be set apart. And unfortunately, the county do not have the money where we can just go out and build roads at people's request. So my personal opinion, it's not a good fit. I would like to make a couple of statements there, Brian, if I could. As I listen to this, a lot of it turns on what was said in the commissioner's meeting when we did this. And we actually did something that I have regretted since we started. We sat there in a group and decided some minimum uh, floor spaces, but we should have let the ordinance stand by itself. And another thing that I hear, if I was going strictly by the ordinance, now I know we've got other things, I'll go to do that. But if you go strictly by the ordinance, there's nothing that's really forbidden in the building on the third road. And I've heard a number of you point out to me that the ordinance probably has not been adhered to. And you're 
probably right. And so the department here might rest with us. We need to go with them this whole thing up. I don't know. But this listing, I don't know if it was so much just uh, uh, an unwillingness to follow, but when you start making, giving dimensions and things to where we sit, it's rather hard to do. So I think that was one of the errors that was made in this whole process. That's all. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, um, I would just make a comment on that. Board of Commissioners do have uh, an option to have conditions on any of their uh, ordinance. So even though we have a standard to go by, there are times where you have to make some provisions with that. And like most counties, we are growing and we've got to make adjustments along the way. But that is one of the options that the board has. So we had that option to provide that and those conditions. And we've done it in other cases as well. So I, I just want to make sure that um, the citizens understand that we do have certain guidelines that we have to go by, but we also can make adjustments along the way. Well, basically what Commissioner Hines said is um, what I want to follow up on. We met there in good faith that night in November, and we came, you know, we offered some suggestions, some, some way to compromise and make, you know, everybody happy, and we agreed on the square footage. Now, it may not be what's in our ordinance, but we do have the right to put conditions when we are rezoning. And I'm not real sure what happened with the, the square footage on the homes, but something's not quite right there. And I have a little trouble issuing it, giving a variance or rezoning again when I'm, I'm not completely satisfied that everything was done on the up and up in that situation with square footage. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any additional comments? Hearing none, I will turn it back to Commissioner Hines. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that the rezoning is denied, that it will stay and remain as LDR and the five acre lots. A second. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Hines, a second by Commissioner Adam. Motion and a second. All in favor?
All right. So, Annie Morgan, we have a motion by Commissioner McCoy to add back to the DTAC board. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. All right. Item number two under unfinished business is first appointment to region for EMS Council to fill the term that expired on June 30th, 2020. Uh, Chairman, Commissioners, I spoke with the Region 4 EMS director on this matter, and uh, he said that uh, we really he would like us to fill the positions, but we could afford to change those that he had since they are county positions. And uh, he had also pointed out that they have three vacant at-large positions. So if we got a medical director, we got someone who's involved in the medical field who would like to serve on that area, uh, on that, uh, uh, that particular appointment, then he said that uh, what they could do is if we could do like an application if possible, yeah, that would be able to have kind of three voices but what I would recommend at tonight is to go ahead and reappoint out by this time to keep Brady to out of the two and three and uh, to do that until uh, further action. Okay. So on um, item number two under unfinished business, um, per the county administrator, the first appointment to Region 4 EMS Council to fill the term that expires on June 30th, 2020. We had Alphonse Pineberg at that position originally. It is a recommendation of the county administrator to reappoint Alphonse Pineberg. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion to reappoint uh, Alphonse Pineberg. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. Item number three, second appointment to Region 4 EMS Council to fill the term that expired on June 30th, 2020. Um, it has been recommended by the county administrator to keep ready to be placed into that position. Do I have a motion? So moved. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. From what Mr. Gay is saying, that they still need someone at large to, to fill, so how many spots, how many? There, there are three at-large spots, okay? And they come from all across the region, probably eight counties or so in the region. Um, and, and what time would that expire? Uh, that, did, that is an appointment that that board actually accepts and makes. So what so we, we have to do to is to come up with a recommendation and then the person will go, you know, they kind of want a resume, and then the person will go before that board and be interviewed for consideration of filling one of those two vacancies. We probably need to add that to the next agenda since it's not on the agenda tonight, or we can add it to a Well, the only thing I would like to know is what are their main requirements so if they can give us a, a list of what it is that they're looking for, what skill sets they're looking for, so that if we, if I know of anyone or think would be a good fit, so they can later on interview them, I don't want to recommend someone that's not meet their requirements for skill sets. And so we can place that on the next agenda and maybe the county administrator get the requirements prior yeah, to that's all I'm asking. I can do that. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item number nine, new business. First item of new business is Ms. Veronica Dowell. Uh, request on behalf of Ms. Beverly Ball, Executive Director of the American Union Relief Society, Incorporated, AURS, Summer Focus Learning Program for funding in the amount of $12,000. Ms. Dowell, are you here tonight? Come forward. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Cadell. Um, and I'm sorry. Do you have any ideas? No. Okay. Um, yes, I am here on behalf of Ms. Um, Ms. Beverly Ball. She's the executive director of the American Union Relief Society, which is better known as ours, uh, some of the focus learning program. And what we would like to do is 
place, $200,000 from the uh, Maryland County Sheriff Department. As you all know, we are in times that are so unconventional and so many changes that are going to have to be made to some program that we're not trying to, uh, we're still trying to make sure that we at least do something for the youth here in Maryland County. And the reason I say that is because uh, Ms., um, there was some program that's still going on right now that is not going to start until July, and that was our thing to kind of start in July. Uh, and looking at the things that we're going to have to purchase, like supplies, endless amounts of hand sanitizer, uh, wipes, and, and just um, thermometers, and you know, a lot of different things to just make sure that we get a, have a safe, happy summer for our youth here in Maryland County. Um, this is not that we're requesting right now, and we hope that that's a great amount. We, we're hoping that that's a good amount to get done what we're looking at doing. The program, we're looking to tentatively start a program on um, uh, July 14th. Um, we know that one program is already running two weeks um, after the 4th of July from that first week to the second week. So we're going to be tentatively that week, which is on a Tuesday, the day following week, or a couple of weeks after the 4th of July, or the week after that. Rick is not set in stone yet based on the school, because we've already been given permission to still use the sixth grade wing of the school at Grand Junior High School. Um, so um, we've already still been told by um, Dr. Griffin that we can use that. And, and Principal um, Jackson is still on board. He said he's good with that. So that was the thing, because we're trying to make sure that we keep them isolated, keep them on one wing. Um, the amount of children is not known yet. Everything's still, like I said, open arms on pretty much how many we're going to um, target and um, the times and everything like that, but we're still in the first year. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioners have any questions? Mr. Chairman, I do. Um, I, I think I was there on the board the very first time this fall that came <laughs> and requested, and I think the first request we ever did was $1,000. I mean, it's been several, several years ago but it got my attention this time because it was going from seven to twelve thousand and and while this fund is generated by fines which technically i guess comes under law enforcement board of commissioners have to we're the ones that have to make a decision on this the um, sheriff's office cannot and i just want to remind the commissioners that there's only there's only like three or four things that you can use this money for and that's drug court drug treatment and drug education and I, with this kind of amount here i'm just a little concerned i mean because i know the whole program is not about drug awareness i know you do something with that so my concern is something with that amount i don't know that we can approve it from that account i'm not saying that we couldn't do it from you know, general fund or something like that but i'm concerned that we can't take that kind of money because i don't think we can account for and bill might can answer this better for falling under the requirements because I got I looked it up to see what the um, requirements and like I said it's, it's not a very big document at all it's just a um, you may take a minute to pull up but it just says you know there's three th I think it's just the three things drug treatment drug education and, and like, you know I know you got to buy sanitizer or hand sanitizer and all that but see in actuality that wouldn't fall under right. legally what we can do under these funds so i just wanted to bring that to our attention and see what you know, everybody else thinks and what our other options might be oh. mr chair um i, I just want to thank Ms. veronica Dow for coming and speaking on behalf of Ms. ball i know for reasons she couldn't be here and as uh, Mr. Hanley said, she's come to us for several times and it has started off in very small amount of things. Inflation, everything has gone up, but she's done a great job for the summer. And we are in COVID-19, so it's just hard to say how things, but I know the importance of making sure our kids stay active this summer and they keep their reading up. I know most every program she did had a section in there that talked about drug prevention, so it may not be able to cover that full amount coming from that fund. So I would like to make a recommendation that some of that funding comes from the general funds from the county and maybe another portion can come from the, the, uh, the 
the date fund thing, you know, just giving you some options. Now, she normally presents that, you know, the breakdown, do you have a budget so we can know exactly what that's going to, because I know you all have to pay for the use of the school. Exactly. We, I do not have that tonight, but we're working on that now. Um, I just hope we with Ms. Stephanie McKean on yesterday from the board of Bay, and I told her I could get with her once I spoke to you all. And that's the thing also, because I do um, actually do the, the, the little egg part, because that's what I do. I'm um, actually special with the substance of the intervention um, for the twins that we're talking about. But I'll be doing this through, through the summer program with the youth also, because I usually go to the summer program and do um, programming with them during the summer months. And I do think that's something we need is a breakdown of the budget, even for what, for the 7000 Because when I went to look, there's there's no documentation, and we have to answer to the, you know, to our auditors and then to the citizens as to how the money is spent. And there's no breakdown of how even the 7000 is done. So, like I said, I think we may have to do a combination of something to make it work, but I don't, it, I, I'm afraid it may not fall under everything under that. I, I do believe they did give us a breakdown. If not, maybe you can provide that for us because one of the things that I was most surprised about was the what they had to pay the school district. Right. Well, and, I mean, that's my thing. Why would the school donate the space? They had to I mean, pay the Why the school board charged them close to, to, yeah, yeah, the the to, 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 I think it was close to four or five thousand dollars of their budget went to utility costs right. and yeah. and transportation. So it's not like there's no no profit or anything. Not that it is supposed to be profit related, but they still had to go out and raise funds to offset the cost because they took the children on field trips. Now this year you may not be able to do that. I think exactly. the most important thing is to make sure that they don't stop their reading exactly. so when they school do start back they're not so far behind exactly that's the thing and with this being my first year and um with her asking me because she asked me a couple of years and then she would take it over and and i definitely told her you know i just couldn't just come in and just do it um but i definitely had to um consult the man instead then consult the man in the house but you know <laughs> other than that everything was you know good because i've done these type of things I've been over some programs, the housing cards in the range, and um, now school programs, so I have no problem with it. And she initially definitely, unfortunately, because of health and her husband said no, and that was the end of that conversation, I'm pretty sure. But she was initially going to make sure she stayed in here and back in and she's back in definitely from afar, and that is the reason why she was not here tonight. But the thing about it is, it just been my first year, and just getting in and just trying to get my feet wet. I thank you know the goodness that I've least been exposed to children here in Maryland County to the point that I know some of them personally. And now we're doing programs in the school system, so that's the reason why we're really trying to figure out how to get a higher number to make sure that we can, like on the mission, how to keep them engaged because they haven't been engaged in months. And I haven't even seen them in months, and that's my thing worry about what's going on in Vegas now to get, get them engaged. Um, there's um, food is still not even until the next August, so even for those three weeks, we want to keep them doing something. And yeah, and I, I understand that. I think you know, it's, it's not time for our new budget, so I think right. Mr. Bill will even <laughs> tell us if we have any funds we can pull from, and maybe you could speak to that. I just don't want us getting any trouble. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's so specific what it can be used for. We keep increasing the amount. I don't think I don't see how we're going to justify because it's all not going for drug education. It's just a portion of it. If you hear what you said about the use of the budget to take person concerns from staff, we need to look at what the use of the budget for the school But Bill and I had, had talked about that previously, and our concern too was with whether or not it would fall within the scope of the use of the date funds, and we sure don't want to get into any problem with that. So, uh, so we do agree that you know there might be some portions of it might qualify, some may have to be funded out of general fund. But perhaps if y'all had a, uh, a budget showing the program, that might make it easier for you guys to be able to make a decision on. I can have one about um you all be um the next meeting is gonna be July third. Uh, right. 
DA's office, 5,000 big bags, about uh, 5,000, like 5, 5, so it's 40, 45,000. Would it, would it be uh, appropriate to have the board say that they were approved the funding in last year and then request for increases we could look at it again later in the year and see how our revenue could be? Would that be? Uh, they, would have to be I mean, they got to do their budget too. Right, I mean, I understand that.
the one that was sat here in, in Greenville, plus another 5% administrative fee to state on salaries and benefits. Darren and I talked to him last year and he declined, but the board declined to agree with that and we're suggesting that we do that again this year. So what we really need to do is, is decide whether or not you want to give their staff a 4%. So what's the total that they're asking for? Uh, from 164, I want 165 up to basically 170, about 5,000. But that's, that's both of them though, right? Is that the, that's the 4% plus the 5%? No, no, that's just the 4%. That's just the 4%. With, uh, they're not suggesting that we decline at 5%. That administrative fee you're talking about? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not real sure exactly what that is. But. <laughs> so the 4% is just a, a, a It's just a, a, a raise. Yeah, it's a raise. Yes, ma'am. And 5% is administrative. We don't know. But we don't really know. Yes. It's something over the yeah, end you look at their, their quote, it's kind of the base salary, just for the uh, assistant public defender, base salary is 72 eight. total with benefits and taxes is 118, and they're asking for 5% on top of that. All right. So here are the recommendations for the approval of this year 2021 budget for the public defender. Do I have a motion to approve the 4% $5,000 and to decline 5% on addition. So moved. I have a motion and a second to approve the 4% and to decline the 5% and then three percentage. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second on the favor. Motion and a second. Second. Do I have a motion and a second on the favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Item number six is to approve this year's 2021 budget for uh, the Department of Public Health. Their request for funding is the same as last year. So do I have a motion to leave the Department of Public Health to remain the same? So moved. Do I have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. Item number seven was stricken from the uh, agenda at the beginning. So we'll move to item number eight which is approved this year 2021 budget for the library. Now, their level of funding is, will remain the same as last year. Here is the recommendation from the library to remain the same budget. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion, do I have a second? Second. All right, motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Item number nine is to approve this year 2021 budget for county agents. Actually, when uh, Ashley Davis or Ashley Harmon did her uh, figure, her budget request was a couple of thousand dollars last, less than last year. You don't get that very often. So it's decreasing to what? To 53 to 18. 53 to 18. <laughs> Make a motion to accept. All right, I have a motion. We have a second. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Bill, I'm having a hard time here too, but I didn't say. I'm sorry. <coughs> item number 14 to approve fiscal year 2021 budget for pathways. Their budget request was the same as last year and the previous, I don't know how many years. What's the amount? 5,000. Hearing that, to remain the same for pathways budget of $5,000, do I have a motion? So I have a motion, I have a second. Sorry. Motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. Item number 18 under the business approved the fiscal year 2021 budget for community action. Um, when Jennifer came before the board last year, she gave uh, submitted a three-year request for twelve thousand dollars a year. Uh, the board approved ten thousand last year. You need to decide whether you want to do the 10000 again this year or the 12000 this year for question. What's the pleasure of the board? 10000 Is that in the form of a motion? Oh, yes, in the form of a motion. All right, so we have a motion to continue with the $10,000 approval for community action. Do we have a second? Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. 
All right, item number 19, resolution for Bear River County and Hazard Mitigation Plan update 2019 to 2024. I have one more thing. Uh, I failed to mention as we were going through, there are several contracts that, that the chair will need to sign and authorize him to sign those as well. And those are for the uh, <coughs> facts the DA's office, public defender, and the uh, county agent. Okay. Here, here in the library. Hearing that, we have a motion for the chair to be able to sign those four documents. So we increase. All right. Have a motion. We have a second. So I motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Item number 19, resolution here for the county hazard mitigation plan update 2019 to 2024. Yes, Mr. Chairman Ford. Basically, this is our uh, hazard mitigation plan that we have to do every five years. Um, we've just spent basically the last year plus uh, completing that the uh, bill uh, got it started and together we pretty much finished it out and uh, we got a, a twenty thousand dollar grant for this and it uh, looks like we're going to be getting back about twenty seven thousand dollars through uh, work uh, through labor uh, costs but uh, it's complete at this time it's been circulated to the cities and we just need the commissioners to uh, sign off on it Hearing that, we have a motion to allow us to sign the resolution. So moved. Have a motion. We have a second. Motion. Motion a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. We will move on out of view business to item number 10. Report from our finance director. Uh, Mr. Chair, you can have to have before you the bike balances. The uh, minimum funds are making pretty steady. Also, you have the property tax right now in the uh, 2019 election for 96.34, which puts us in good shape for the uh, tax digestion for next year. And that's all I have unless you have any questions. All right. Thank you. Any commissioners have any questions for finance correct? All right. Hearing none, we'll move on to item number 11, report from our county administrator. Uh, Chairman Commissioner Bobby Beard is very brief on this. Uh, I wanted to let you guys know the issue of notice to proceed on the uh, LMIG and the Orange Road contracts. We are waiting for the return of the contract on Bill Hayward when we're ready to move forward with that. Uh, they, uh, When you say you're waiting on the contract on Hill Haven, is that waiting for the whoever was awarded the yeah, contract? Waiting for them to return, return all the documents to us. Okay. We have uh, reached out to them, and I would expect them to be in the same relation to those who received from them as well. Um, going to the basis of the Bed Lake monitoring that the Rand Linfield was, uh, was clear for May, we received that. Um, and we are looking. package out for uh, a couple of new ambulances that's coming as well and uh, I think the Shirley may want to talk about we got some news today from the state president of the Toyota party I think she might want to mention that and uh, I did have some things that I want to just update you guys on the executive session but I can I can call you and uh, just advise if, uh, if y'all want to refer to that since we probably do need to have executive session I think sure. Okay, all right, we can do that. Okay, so that's really all I have. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next item, number 12, report from the county commissioner. We'll start with Commissioner Bray. I don't have anything. All right, Commissioner Hadden. Just have a couple of things. This Saturday, beginning at 10 o'clock, will be the uh, Warm Springs Freedom Celebration. This is our fourth annual parade. We just want the kids to come. You can bring your pets, whatever, dress up in your red, white, and blue. We will have a flyover like we had last year. So that's sponsored by the Merchants Association. So I hope they'll come down and give the merchants a little support. It's been tough with them having to be closed all of these months, and they could certainly use some support. And other than that, I hope everybody has a wonderful 4th of July and it's safe at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner uh, McCoy. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to run over a couple of items. 
those items being the uh, work that we're doing down at the Flint River for the canoe trail, and also the what we're pushing to do in the state, as I mentioned to you before, is offer to do a good well, this can pretty much take over the funding, except for some smaller items. By the next meeting, I hope I have the deed and everything ready to go that we can approve, and the uh, the lease agreement with the state. If we lease to them for 25 years, they will turn around and spend the money themselves and do the work, including getting all the permits and that sort of thing. So you'll hear me talk about that the next meeting that we have. The other item I have, we're trying very hard to close out everything on the Lake Merriweather grant. As a matter of fact, we've gotten in quite a few new fire rings down there that we were trying to get uh, accomplished and in for the uh, picnic, as well as the picnic tables that we've gotten there. Uh, one other item, we're going to put up some uh, uh, signage, signage, especially along the trail, that will be interpreted signage. And we've got those on board. We should have those here shortly too. So hopefully by the end of this month, maybe just a tad in July, we can pretty well close out and have the money from the grant to fund the very things I'm talking about. And that's about all. And Commissioner, uh, almost catch that. That's okay. Um, I'm going to start off with my good news. Zoom. Oh, so it is. I'm excited to share this news with the board and as well as the citizens of Meriwether County. Um, a year ago when I was on the Three Rivers Board, um, they brought to our attention a particular grant. It was called the State Road and Tollway Authority. And after hearing the information about this grant, I felt that it was a good fit for Meriwether County. So I brought it to the board and Mr. Gay, um, Took it, I brought it to the board and Mr. Gay uh, decided to submit Meriwether County's name as a project for this, um, for County Line Road, which is uh, a road that's connecting our industrial park. Well, glad to say today, we were approved. Oh, that is great. Yeah. Yeah. So, on behalf of the State Road and Tow Authority, I would like to congratulate you on Georgia's Transportation Infrastructure Bank the GTIB loan awarded the amount of $150,000 as a grant awarded in, I'm sorry, $150,000 as, as a grant and then $100,000 as a loan that will be used for the improvement of County Line Road and the bridge improvement project. So this is a great project for us. It's part of our industrial park. And uh, I have a citizen who lives on that road. I know will love me and kiss me forever. And that's Mr. Cecil Hay. But um, we were also able to pass our T splash. And our T splash, having that pass, is one of the main reasons made it more acceptable for us to get this grant. Uh, we reached out to uh, Lynn Westmoreland, who's with GDOT, to um, meet with him. We met with him earlier to let him know this uh, project. And so we're going to hopefully meet back with him when we ever can set up a T-Squash work session. And then he can share with us other options. But I've also identified another grant that I'll bring to the board. And hopefully with this grant, T-Squash, we're able to keep minimize the funds that we have to use on the county because we got so many other projects. But I'm excited about this opportunity. So I thank Mr. Gay and his staff for putting the time in. I know we do need, you know, you hear me say this all the time, there's so many opportunities and grants out there, and hopefully at some point in time we can bring someone on, on our staffing that will help us even apply for more of these grants. Uh, I just sent another grant out to everyone, it's called Our Town, so if you didn't get the email, I'll send it to you, and once again, this is another good opportunity for us to take advantage of. The other thing I want to mention um, to um, my fellow commissioners, I had sent you all an email regarding House Bill 426. Um, it is the uh, hate crime bill. Uh, I was hoping that we could look at it as a resolution, but I'm glad to say that it was, it did pass today through the Senate. So Georgia now has a hate crime bill. Uh, and, um, you know, this to me on a personal basis helped us move forward as a state. And once again, and I say kudos to our legislators 
and making that happen. So that's all I have. Thank you. And I will pass my time. We've been here a couple hours tonight, so there's really nothing that I have that is detrimental. We will move on to our next area, and that is for our county attorney. I have no report that this sounds like we need a small quick session of the attorney. For possible litigation. Litigation of orders. Of course, sir. All right, possibly. All right, thank you. Thank you. And then the next item, item number 14, is public comment. We have three individuals signed up to speak and as I call your name if you'll go to the podium you'll have three minutes we'll time that for you and the first on the sheet is Arceus Greer. Thank you very much. All right, we have next 
person, Catherine Jenkins, that you will have the name and address of the name. My name is Catherine Jenkins. My address is 833 John Tramley Road, Grantland, Georgia. Um, so I'm here today in regards to the uh, behavior of uh, Mr. Dwight Allen, uh, also known as Bubba Allen. And I, I've become aware of some of his antics that have been um, just beyond the pale. Uh, he's engaged in behavior that has been nothing at, at, at the very least divisive and, and in so many ways unprofessional. But before I get into that, let me just say this is an excerpt from the U.S. Census website and it's under the title of Partners. In quotations, Census partners are vital to ensuring a complete and accurate count. As trusted voices in your communities, you play a vital role in ways of raising awareness that the 2020 census is easy, safe, and important. So let me just reiterate, as trusted voices. So what we've, what we've seen from Mr. Allen is behavior that has been purposefully divisive, immature, denigrating to certain classes of people, as well as race. And it's completely beyond what is necessary for someone who is a member of two countywide boards. Uh, from what my understanding is, and I don't have a personal account, but I understand that Mr. Allen, um, after making, making several comments on Facebook, he uh, went out to a uh, legal protest and took pictures of people and made denigrating comments about the people themselves, uh, children that were present, as well as um, the people that were involved. So this is behavior by a private citizen, and he put it on a private page, but it's also public. And this behavior is now, as a member of not one, but two county boards, reflects poorly on Mary Mother County. This should not stand. Mr. Allen's actions and words have, begun, have gone far beyond his behavior. His behavior is now either sanctioned by our county government, or it is not. Now, apologies are something that do help, and they can heal wounds. But apologies that are compelled do little, if anything, to fix these kind of wrongs. So I'm going to read another excerpt. This is from Mr. Allen himself that posted this eight hours ago on Facebook, which again is also public. I was accused of mocking a local protest, which has led some people on my friend list being attacked. Rather than someone end up hurt or in jail, I was compelled to offer up an apology. So that does not sound like the words of someone who we want to represent us in Maryland County. So I hope you'll consider those words. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next on the list, we have Ms. Dale Williams. And Dale, if you'll just give your name and address. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nell Wilkins, I'm 500 Max Anderson Drive, Manchester, Georgia. And um, thank you for allowing me to speak. And I, I really won't take up too much time even mentioning that person that um, I keep was talking about the same person. So there's no need for that. But at the same time, I did have a face-to-face -face experience because I didn't know who he was. I um, just saw that someone was stalking us throughout the whole meeting, got there early that morning. So I say this to that that when we represent someone, and I, I know um, Ms. Gregia and I, we are um, somewhat friends, and when that happened, I found out that this person was appointed. I don't stay on the Meriwether page. Um, it's a lot of everything but what I would love to represent. But when I found out this person was appointed, and I did come to Ms. Gregia and asked, how can you represent, how can you appoint someone that doesn't have the love of the peace for everybody? And so when we're representing or uh, recommending someone to these boards, we need to be careful. We really need to be careful. Mainly I'm here to say that systemic racism is real. And it's real right here in Meriwether County. And, when, and, and being that ignorant is not bliss, let me say this. All lives does matter. But right now the nation is taking a knee to point out 
the abuse, the mistreatment of African American people. And that's what it's about. It's not once have said, well, not once have we said that other lives don't matter. But there are some things that are happening that we ask that there's some empathy in. It. If you come and tell me that your mother has cancer, whether my mom has cancer or not, I'm going to empathize with you. Because what hurts me hurts you. So I'll say this. Matthew told us, and I'm a preacher, but I'm not here to preach to you. He said in 25, 40 through 45, that when you do it unto the least of them, and not that African American are the least, but when it's done for those that you may think are the least, you've done it unto the Lord. I bring that up because the most, the most unified place that we think we have is the house of God. The most unified place that we say we have is in our faith. So I ask all of us, we will continue to do BL on Black Lives Matter because it does matter. And until it matters to everybody, it's ineffective in this whole county. I pray, thank you sir, I pray that we will stop and have the conversation. Just stop and have the conversation. Let's not overlook it. We love the police, we need the police, but there needs, some be, needs to be reform in everything. And there's no one race to blame. We all have to look at ourselves. But I believe we could be better together. As Dr. King said, we either come together as brothers and sisters or we perish as fools. And I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to be a fool in here today. So please, when we are appointing people, please know what they are thinking and how their character is because he stopped us constantly that day. And then, by the way, the protest started at 11. And if there were only two people there, we stood for Juneteenth, our Emancipation Day, and we stood legally with a permit to protest, not march, along with what was going on. We thought it was on Thursday when we got our permit. On Thursday, not on Friday. So we applaud the efforts there, but we also, I'm requesting that somewhere, we don't need government to have a conversation. But if you're going to represent us, if you're going to represent we the people, we expect you to at least hear us. Thank you for all you do. God bless you. Bless you for your grant today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for tonight. We will move on to the next section, which is for the executive session. We do have a need for possible litigation and for personnel issues. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. We are uh, motion and second. All in favor? Motion carried. We're in executive session at 819. Thank you all. It could be a while. I'll just talk to you then. Are we going to the Yeah, I'm fixing to take this out of the way. All right. There you go. Come on through. All right. Thanks. Uh-huh. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.